Welcome everyone to today's devotion. We are in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, uh, and we find Paul, he's going to have to do this for uh, a few chapters, uh, particularly as, as he closes out his, his letter to the Corinthians, of defending his authority with the Corinthians. Uh, remember that a big chunk of the book is about um, Paul having to, to do so. Uh, and one of the ways he's done it is to demonstrate his endurance through suffering um, and and how that benefits them and how it demonstrates um, his faith, the faithfulness he has to, to, to his calling. Well, in chapter 10, uh, he really begins to defend that uh, apostleship, that authority. Uh, it'll get more specific in uh, later chapters, but, but here he really introduces it. And um, it is worth pausing and considering how it is that Paul goes about doing this. If you had to defend yourself, how, how would you do it? Uh, chances are we would do so by raising our voice and pulling out our resume. Uh, can't you see what all I've done for you? Um, look at all that I've accomplished. Look at my degree. Look at this or that. Uh, that's usually how we would defend ourselves. Paul doesn't do any of that. Uh, Paul looks at his courage, um, not just amid suffering, but in how he addresses the issues in uh, Corinth. Uh, he, he approaches it with humility. Uh, this is not something he wants to have to do, uh, but is being compelled to have to do it. He is doing it uh, by giving them an example of, of what a godly life looks like and, and how one ought to carry themselves. And he also looks at the Corinthians themselves. He's saying essentially, look, look, don't, don't forget that we have built a relationship for, for years and that God used us to build, to, to found the church in Corinth. We're having this conversation because of uh, the blessings God gave us while we were in the city of, of Corinth. And so all of that is introduced here in chapter 10. He says, starting in verse 1, I, Paul, myself, entreat you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, I who am humble and face to face with you, but bold toward you when I am away. I beg of you that when I am present, I may not have to show boldness with such confidence as I count on showing against some who suspect us of walking according to the flesh. Notice here, you have both courage and humility colliding. Uh, often we, we, we think those sort of ideas don't, don't really, really mesh. And here, here they do. Paul is saying, is, look, I, I write to you with meekness and gentleness. These are two fruit of the Spirit, aren't they? Uh, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, um, uh, faithfulness, self-control. To, to, to have an attitude of meekness, a lost art today. Uh, and chances are, um, when you really think about what meekness is, um, it is it is a a humble courage. It is a uh, is a humble uh, gentleness. Um, we need more people who who exemplify that because right now we have a lot of people who who just want to rant and rave and destroy and devour and all that sort of stuff. Regardless, he, he says, "I want to be meek and gentle with you uh, in in exhorting you to reject false truths." And, and to understand my authority and, and the message that, that I bring. And then he, he raises this, this common accusation against Paul. Uh, he introduces it here in verse 1. Uh, he who is humble when face to face, but bold when away. Uh, later he, he, will, he will add, uh, he, he'll explain that, that when he writes his letters, uh, they're, they're uh, strongly written. And strongly worded, and we've seen that some of the examples of of First Corinthians and Second Corinthians, uh, for example, when he deals with the man um, living in immorality with his stepmother, he'll say, "Throw that one to Satan, right? Hand him over to Satan, uh, lest the whole church be destroyed." Uh, when he condemns the uh, members for suing each other, he uses strong language. Um, but but the accusation is is that when he writes his letters, he's he's very strong and bold and and uh, dangerous, but then when he shows up, he's very gentle and kind and patient and all that sort of stuff. Now, Paul doesn't see a contradiction between the two, but he is pleading with them, look, get your house in order. Let it be that, that I have to write these things, uh, but then by the time I arrive, um, they, they, they've been sorted. So this is a real challenge to the leadership of the church. 
to deal with these sort of things. Uh, I beg of you, he says, that when I'm present, I may not have to be so bowed towards you. Uh, and I'm confident um, that that I can count on you. Um, but uh, he goes on to verse 7. Look at what is before your eyes. If anyone is confident that he is in Christ, let him remind himself that just as he is in Christ, so also are we. Paul really, um, is probably something worth exploring more detail is Paul's theology of unity. Uh, and at its core is the redemptive story of Christ. We're all united that we are sinners, and as believers we're all united that we've been redeemed. Um, so, so we are together in that we are Christ. For even if I boast a little too much of our authority, which the Lord gave us for building you up and not for destroying you, I will not be ashamed. And this again is another point. He said, God has called us for building up the church, for establishing churches around the empire. He said, but these cats are destroying the church of Christ by causing unnecessary divisions. Um, I came across a really helpful definition of what is a cult. We could probably broaden a uh, cult to just a false belief system in general. Uh, I hope I can get it right. Uh, they add to the gospel, they subtract from the personal work of Christ, and they divide the people of God. I find that really helpful. A false teacher uh, is one who will add to the gospel, uh, subtract from the person of Christ, and divide the people of God. And what you have in Corinth, at the very least, are those who are contributing to the divisions, unnecessary division within the church. Uh, verse 9, I do not want to appear to be frightening you with my letters, for they say, and here he comes back to that, his letters are weighty and strong, but his bodily presence is weak, and his speech uh, of no account. Now Paul's addressed this, uh, he addressed it in First. Corinthians chapter 1 and 2, and he says, when I came to you, I didn't have wisdom of, of speech. I, I, wasn't, I didn't have great oratory skills. Where Paul, you, you get the impression Paul was a, was a great mind, but not a great speaker. Uh, if, if you've ever been to college, maybe you had a professor like this who you thought, man, he is so smart, and, and, and this guy can, can write academic works uh, in, in an incredible way. But man, he cannot deliver uh, a, a a lecture or a class for nothing. Maybe you had a professor like that. I don't know. I certainly had some. Then I had some who who were just great in class. And I had one who he wrote one book because he was told that as a PhD he had to write one book. So he wrote it decades ago, and he said, "I never will write another book. I just want to teach." He was a great teacher. Uh, really, was was. Uh, uh, one of my favorite teachers in seminaries, a cult class, actually. Um, and, uh, uh, but you, you almost get a sense Paul's like this. He, he's, he's a good writer and a uh, very educated man, very smart, but his, his uh, skills in speaking and teaching and preaching may not have been as strong. And so the impression was he's one man behind a pen, another man in a pulpit. And, and Paul is saying, look, look, I don't want to have to be so bold with you in person. I shouldn't have to be. So one of the things that gets frustrating in, in life is, is that there are obvious things and simple things that a lot of problems could be solved quite simply. And you get frustrated that you have to deal with this sort of stuff. That's ministry in, 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 in a nutshell. Verse 11, let such a person understand that what we say by letter when absent we do when present. Right? He's dealing with that common criticism. Not that we dare to classify or compare ourselves with some of those who are connect, commending themselves, but when they measure themselves by one another and compare themselves with one another, they are without understanding. Now think about it. It's, it's these false teachers are saying, uh, we're the good guys because, well, we're the good guys. Look at us. Aren't we good? So this is why Paul's so hesitant of boasting. He'll say later that if we must boast, verse 17, let the one who boasts boast in the Lord. And so that's why Paul, with gentleness and meekness and humility, is speaking of his courage to, to not even to endure suffering, but also to, to deal with the challenges of, of, of in the Corinthian church. Look, it's easy in leadership to just... Uh, uh, ignore things because you don't want to stir trouble. Right? That is not real leadership. 
uh, leadership requires great courage. And Paul's saying, look, there's these guys here who they think they're, they're, they're the right stuff because they tell themselves that when they look in the mirror every morning. He says, no, look, I've got the courage to tell you that these things are unacceptable. That is real leadership, and it's the sort of leadership we lack, not just at a public level, but, but, but in private levels, at work, in churches, in the home, in the marriage. We have to be able to have a sort of courage to where, with humility, we can address some of these things. Well, to conclude, verse 15, we do not boast beyond limit in the labors of others, but our hope is that as your faith increases, our area of influence among you may be greatly enlarged, so that we may preach the gospel in lands beyond you without boasting of work already done in another's area of influence. You see what he's saying there? He said, look, my big goal here is not to start a following. That's what those guys are doing. So, so, so we may exert influence with you so that our influence may enlarge, allowing us to go to other areas of the empire that do not have a church being planted. Paul mentions this in, in Romans, uh, is in chapter 16, I believe, where he says, uh, one of the reasons we haven't come to you is the church has already been planted. Our mission is to go where there isn't an evangelical, gospel-preaching, Bible-believing church. And so he says, although I want to come see you and encourage you and be encouraged by you, it hasn't been as big of a priority as some of these other areas. Paul's long-term goal is to get to Spain. And there's some evidence internally in the Bible and externally in, in, in history, tradition, that he actually did make it before returning back to Rome where he was executed in the mid-60s. Um, that's Paul's aim. He says, look, look, I, I don't want to have to keep babysitting you. Rather, I want you guys to keep growing in Christ so that together we can do bigger and better things. I want you to pause for a minute and consider your local church situation. What could your church be doing right now if everyone, every member of that church loved each other, were growing in Christ, unified in fellowship, and focused on a single vision for that church? And what if the thousands of churches in our country were like that. Where would we be? Now, there's something, there's something within the most humans that we look for reasons to be divided. We look for reasons because when you're you're divided, when you're, you're you're divided, then that feeds our self righteousness. I'm on the right side. And Paul says, "No, we look. What we want is a the people of God to pursue." The, the, the person of Christ so that together we can do bigger and better things and to reach more people with Christ. As you've been reached with the gospel, may there be more people reached with the gospel. What a vision Paul has. And it makes you wonder, is the vision of our churches, the vision of each believer in this country, in our communities, are they too small? And if so, what must we do right now to fix that? Lord willing, we'll see you guys here tomorrow.